Welcome back to the 240th episode of the Daily Flip Podcast. I'm your host, Alex, and today we're going to be flipping through some of the top stories, including how one of America's greatest cities may be running towards bankruptcy, how the fake images of Donald Trump with some supporters could be an issue going into this next election, and an article about a really, really dumb uh, homeowner law in New York City. And of course, we will end today with our daily delight, a story meant to leave you feeling positive and ready to take on the day. Now, that's enough rambling for me. Let's jump in to our daily debate. So at the very founding of our nation, the founding fathers, they were, I take that back, not the founding, the reconstruction of our nation under the Constitution. So we're talking about in 1779. We have a new constitution. Alexander Hamilton, once he gets into office, he's there as the Treasury Secretary essentially and says, Guess what, guys? We're gonna we're gonna take on the state's debts and we're gonna take on their spending from the war, and we are going to alleviate them of this burden, and we're going to kind of disperse it so that every state's taxes are gonna pay into this and eventually pay it off. Now we're looking at situations where States are spending out the wazoo. Certain cities and states are spending out the wazoo, especially some of these large cities in all different types of states, red states, blue states, and we had this during COVID as well. Do you see some sort of federal debt relief plan coming in? Or do you see Biden, do you see Trump saying, all right, uh, hey guys, we're going we're gonna to take on your debt. We're going to take on this burden for you. It's going to come with a few strings, but hey, we're going we're gonna to take on this, this debt and alleviate you and your citizens of this burden because we know that you've been so irresponsible that we want to give you a little bit of a reset. Sorry, I may have thrown my own opinion in there towards the end, but tell me what you think. Is that something that's going to happen? Is there just going to be a total cancellation of debt? I heard that opinion from somebody when I was doing my job the other day, uh, they were saying, oh, yeah, I think everything's just going to be canceled. I mean, China owes us money. We owe them money. Everything's just going to be canceled. I was like, I don't think that's how it works, especially when there are uh, debtors who are more than just governments but private individuals. They're not going to accept just a cancellation of debt, or at least if they thought that way, they would never buy debt from any of these countries ever, ever again. And by debt, I mean bonds and securities and things of that nature. So, Tell me what you think. Throw it down in the comment section. Let's jump to our first article. It's coming from the New York Post, and the headline reads, Lawmakers' drunken sailor spending spree is sure to bankrupt New York. And, you know, this is one of those returning themes. We hear it quite a lot that a lot of useless spending is going on throughout the United States, and you hear it sometimes on the federal level. You hear it every once in a while on the state level. Then again, you hear more about surpluses on the state level. I mean, Virginia had uh, a huge surplus. That's where Yunkin got his Yunkin bucks or whatever he actually ended up calling it. He's like, oh, yeah, I'll just hand out $500 to all my constituents. I mean, hey, um, I am still registered in Virginia. I still intend to live there soon. So I got a nice little uh, check from Glenn Yunkin. Did it change my opinion of him at all? No, not really, but maybe it did for some other people. Um, and I don't know if that was necessarily his idea. Maybe he really was just saying, hey, no, we have a surplus. We took some of your tax dollars. Now we're going to give some of your tax dollars back. Maybe that's really why he did it. But uh, it's it's interesting because you see these different stories. You see different states having different plans. And then you hear about major cities, and you hear almost all of them are in debt. So let's jump to the first and second, maybe even the third paragraph from this first article. Because you, you know how if you uh, read the New York Post, they like to break things up and be a little bit snappy. So they have really short paragraphs or sentences that get straight to the point of things. But it doesn't necessarily always flow. So I'm going to try to you know weave them together here really quickly. Quote, state lawmakers must be smoking some of that wacky tobacco they legalized because the one house budget bill that was passed this week are utterly off the rails. The bill came in response to Governor Kathy Hochul's spending scheme and her upping her $233 billion bottom line by a jaw-dropping $13 billion. And what well, you may be thinking, well, what is what is that? Do, upping it by uh, 13 compared to the 233. I mean, that's that's nothing. I mean, that's a 
five percent increase, and you're probably saying, "Yeah, that, that's nothing in the grand scheme of things. That's fair." But uh, at the end of the day, maybe we should acknowledge that we're already saying the budget is two hundred and thirty-three billion dollars. "Quote: Lawmakers are looking to shell out nearly a quarter of a trillion dollars. So altogether, it's going to come out to four hundred and sorry, two hundred and forty-six billion for the state fiscal year starting April 1st. It's pure madness. An Olympic leap of 73 billion, or about 42% over just five years ago. Hack Biden inflation looks tame in comparison. I'm oh, sorry. Heck, Biden inflation looks tame in comparison. Prices have risen only 23% in that time. So, What's going on? I mean, why why is this necessary? What are they actually going to be doing with this money? Because, hey, I may not necessarily like the idea that there's going to be a, a larger budget for random boondoggles, but if they're going to put in a, a new monorail system, if they're going to build new infrastructure, if they're going to take down old uh, apartments and make new ones. I mean, you know, there are lots of different projects that I could think of off the top of my head. Renewing the the pipes that the water goes through, these sort of things like this. If they're doing stuff like that, maybe you can justify it. Uh, except for the fact that you actually have less citizens in New York City than on average over the last 10 years because of COVID and people leaving because they said they were going to raise taxes which is going to be inevitable when they raise the budget like this, especially when the population is smaller. So let me ask this. The budget has gone up by uh, a shocking 42%. So let's just round it out to say that it was around uh, $150 billion a few years ago. And that was dispersed among 100,000 people. Let's be clear, that's not the actual population in New York, but we're going to extrapolate. And they are paying... uh, 20% of their income in order to pay that off. Now, you have a much larger bill to pay. You're looking at $246 billion. And instead of 100,000 people, maybe you have 70,000 people, 60,000 people. If it's a real, the emigration was really as bad as people imagined emigration leaving the state, uh, the state or the city, then maybe it's like 50,000. I highly doubt they lost half their population, but the point still stands. You have a larger bill to pay with less friends at the table. I mean, you're splitting it more ways. Now, instead of paying 20%, they may have to raise it to 25% of your income goes to taxes or 30% of your income goes to taxes, which is only going to Take the top line people who could afford to pay it but just don't want to because the tax rate is so high and have them flee again. And that was the other part of the situation with COVID and all these people leaving. At the end of the day, the people that actually have the means to immediately pick up and find a nice new house somewhere else, uh, they are making a lot of money, which means their tax rate would be higher. So not only are you actually making the pie bigger, well, the pie analogy, we'll go with the bill analogy, not only are you making the bill bigger, but that one or two rich friends that would be willing to take on a little bit larger share of the bill because money is a little bit more dispensable in their mind, like, oh, hey, they can throw out an extra $50 here, an extra $50 there, they left the table a long time ago. So it's definitely going to be interesting, but maybe we should describe what they actually intend on using the money for, because like I said, if it goes to a good cause, some people may be willing to do it. Quote, much of the lawmakers' outlay would go to the state education and health care industries whose unions lord over Albany lawmakers. The Assembly, for example, adds a whooping $5.1 billion to Hochul's $45.8 billion for the state education department. Both houses and both houses added billions to Medicare spending, rejecting even the governor's modest curb in runaway multi-billion dollar personal care aid program that's seen massive fraud and soaring uh, 1,200% since 2016. Never mind that New York's per capita Medicare costs are the highest in any state and 70% above the national average per the Empire State's totaling... Wow, let's set up here. $83.4 billion in 2022. Some of the lawmakers' small tack-ons 
are fund on full on drunken sailor. Quote, 80 million for new cannabis rescue and relief fund, 10 million for toll free calls for inmates, 10 million for minority and women, uh, women owned business startup venture capital fund, uh, 5.1 million for various labor initiatives, 175 million for healthcare for illegal migrants, so on and so forth. So let's be clear. Out of the total $246 billion, these small little add-ons don't necessarily look like much. I mean, what, we're talking $10 million, $80 million, another $10 million, $5.1 million, uh, $175 million. Now, just imagine that there are 100, 130, 150 of these because everybody has to have something they can take back to their constituency. They're sitting there at the negotiating table and they're saying, okay, hold on. Well, John, I understand that your district wants these Medicare provisions, but uh, I, you know, I need this school provision to go up or I I need this uh, toll free calls for the inmates who are living in my district because their family members would get mad at me if they can't call them on the weekends. Like, there are so many different little tit tat tit tats tit tats that get negotiated out in these spending bills. And sure, I understand in order to get the overall budget passed, to get people to approve it, they have to have some skin in the game. They have to have some meat on the bones so that they can, you know, political meat at least, political red meat to take back to some of their base. But this is a lot, a lot of money overall that we are talking about. And at the end of the day, if it is going to things like education, and I guess if you want to say Medicare, even though the cost of Medicare is the highest, one of the highest in the nations, and the author is claiming that there is fraud within the system. I do not live in New York. I do not pay attention to New York politics probably as much as I should to actually comment on that sort of thing. But let me ask this. If you're a voter and you know Medicare is fraudulent, I'm not saying it is because I can't testify that to 100%, but I'm saying if it is in New York, and you know that it is as a voter, are you going to be happy that more funding is going into it and it can be siphoned off to healthcare providers, insurance agencies, uh, call, what are they called, the long-term living facilities that your parents may be going to that charge an exorbitant amount because they know most of it is subsidized? Would you be happy with that? Would you seriously say, hey, yes, this is, this is where I want my money? Now, for education, um, I'm going to be honest with you. New York's education system just like California's education, just like most of the education systems across the entire United States on a state-by-state basis, are not improving outcomes right now. I think there's uh, maybe 10 states, 10, maybe 15 states, that have had improved scores in almost every single category, uh, whether it be math, reading, and then the subcategories, uh, reading, apprehension, critical thinking, so on and so forth in every single category after COVID. In some other ways, some of these educational systems are falling back in certain localities. Uh, In Baltimore, I know the math score isn't looking too great. I know Virginia was behind in reading there for a little tiny bit, but that may have been a few years ago, even before the pandemic. So when you have these sort of things happening and you see an education system that is not necessarily producing the best results, at least on a national scale, because that's the headlines, even if in, in New York, it is doing a little bit better. I highly doubt that every single school is up to snuff because it can't always be. I mean, we're going to have different rates everywhere. So at the end of the day, you're going to look at spending like this and say, okay, we've done this before. Is it actually going to help improve my child in the school system? And does hiring more teachers necessarily help your kid with the skills? Maybe. I think if they propose more money to pay school, uh, pay teachers, uh, either good quality teachers or hire more teachers, I think maybe there could be an argument there. Smaller class sizes allow for more one-on-one time. Uh, a teacher may not have to deal with as many students overall, so they can give a more personal approach. They can spend more, I guess, equivalent to office hours with the, the students. But if they're just going to increase funding for certain programs or new lab technology or the more paper, and let's be clear, a lot of teachers end up buying their own supplies. I am fully aware of that. But depending on how this money is allocated, then it may not actually do the job that they intended to do. So I would take a really deep comb through this if I'm looking at it and saying, hmm, okay, I live in New York, and is this bill actually going to do anything good for us. And 
let's be honest, Catherine Hochul, she is a, or sorry, Kathy Hochul, she is a mayor who has come in at a hard time after Chris Cuomo. She did win, uh, rewin election with uh, Zeldin, I believe is how you pronounce his last name. So obviously so, she's doing something right. She's deploying the National Guard. It's not all dreary, dark, rainy sadness, but you need to take a serious examination when the budget just keeps on increasing. And even after COVID spending, the budget maintains that high level that it was over COVID spending. Because the author points out here that it's 42% above where it was almost five years ago, which is, guess what? Before COVID. So why are we maintaining COVID level spending after COVID's over? That is a serious question, especially when a lot of those resources that were put out there in the budget during the COVID era were going to health care costs and the other necessary things that were aiding the response to COVID in this giant state. So why would we maintain that spending? I mean, it's not like they're actually spending the same amount of money on masks or on long-term health care facilities or uh, nurses or different subsidies for uh, families that are having a hard time. It's not, so they've just actually changed how they're spending it, but they're still spending that same amount of money, which would be really frustrating if you're a New York taxpayer and you're saying, well, hey, we were able to get by before COVID without all this extra spending, so why is it different now? But hey, you know, like I said, I don't live in New York and I don't have to worry about it. But I really do pray for the people who do live in New York who are like, whoa, okay, hold on, this bill, uh, I don't know about all that, chief. So let's jump to our second article that comes from the Associated Press. The headline reads, fake images made to show Trump with black supporters highlight concerns around AI and elections. So I think that this is very, very well-founded. I think when I first heard about this controversy, I was saying, let's hope to God that it wasn't the Trump campaign that put it out there. Let's also hope to God that it wasn't an adversary putting it out there saying, and hey, then we'll eventually leak it, that it's actually, once the Trump supporters actually go out and use it, and when it's pushed a little bit, and then we leak that it's a deep fake AI image, then we can say, oh, look at them just attaching this, using this deep fake technology. I'm not saying that anybody is that malicious, but it did definitely cross my mind, no doubt about that. And also, if the campaign Trump, the campaign Trump, the Trump campaign decided to use it, it was definitely going to come in and nip them in the butt. So you probably saw this story. And the reason I held off on it for a while is because I wanted a little bit more stuff to uh, play out. I wanted to see some of the comments die down. I wanted to see how people responded to it. And it was interesting. There, there were some people that responded like, okay, hey, this actually may not be 100% accurate, but it still shows that in the black community, there is a, a resonance for, for Trump. And I was like, okay, I guess you could make an argument that, yes, some more black males are saying that they're willing to, to vote for Trump and that he obviously is speaking to them in some sort of way, but you can't say anything about this this photo. But, hey, I, I didn't understand their rationale completely, and why why should I have? Because at the end of the day, they're talking about a fake image that should have no weight on our political conversation. Now, I understand when we thought it was real, it should, because maybe it does actually elucidate the fact that Trump is not necessarily hated by all African-American people, and then all people of the African-American descendancy, all black people, whatever way you want to frame it, whatever word you want to use, I never know which one's technically acceptable anymore. But the idea that everybody in that community absolutely hates Donald Trump is a pretty stupid proposition right from the beginning, as well as the fact that none of these communities are monoliths, so to pretend as though showing this image means, oh, yes, the, the entire black, and let's be clear, they're not saying that the entire black community is behind Trump, but they're saying, look, the black community can't be behind Trump. If some of the black community can be behind Trump, everybody could uh, ask, that is stupid. As I see it, that is stupid. It is, there's no, I, I hate, because it's an SNL joke that I remember, oh, the, the black conservative meaning, oh, hey, we're not a monolith. So I hate just using it because it just plays into this language. But no single community is all-encompassing in all votes in one way or another. So to use this as evidence for or against, it, 
it's frustrating at the end of the day. The more important thing that's happening here, besides the political considerations of how this is going to bite Donald Trump in the, the butt, which I think that is not the important part of this story. It is the AI deep fake nature of this sort of thing. You saw Mr. Trump and his campaign put out some images of Ron DeSantis that were disingenuous. Uh, I believe it was shaking hands with Dr. Fauci during the early parts of the primary. This was an AI-generated image. It got a whole bunch of hate online, and now you're seeing images like this pop up, which even if they, for a moment, make Donald Trump look better, he probably should just say, hey, guys, uh, we shouldn't do this. Biden should also come out and say, this is an unspoken rule now. The DNC, the RNC... Uh, third-party actors that are involved in the election process. I mean, we've had these conversations. Every single one of them should come out and say AI images are unacceptable in elections. And guess what? A lot of different ins institutions are. A lot of different elected officials are coming out and talking about how this is scary to them. A lot of people are talking about this, how this is not okay. But I want a full and utter, uh, how should I say, blacklisting of all this sort of technology, even the idea of it, all of it needs to be talked about from every single official that is involved in these elections whatsoever, and it needs to be unanimous, and it needs to be bipartisan. Maybe there needs to even be a law on the books, because if we don't address this now, in I am a person who doesn't necessarily love, love the idea of every single thing being, hey, we need to have the government solve this. Of course, we as a populist can say, hey, we're going to not, if somebody has a whole bunch of AI images for the campaign, we can say, we're not going to put you in the office because you were using fake AI images. And even if they were harmless, we just don't like it on the principle of the matter. And maybe we don't do it on a federal level because it, maybe that's too much power to the, the federal government. And also, the Constitution clearly outlays the fact that elections will be handled by the state. So if you want to make this a, an election argument saying, hey, during an election time, you can't use fake images, fa false advertising, it could fall under that one as well. Maybe there's already precedent under that statute now that I think about it more thoroughly. But the idea that this could interfere with uh, elections and the states are supposed to administer their elections, they're supposed to decide how they do it, when they do it, so on and so forth. Maybe the states could take this on under that purview and they could find a workaround through the Constitution to tie it in. So even if it would go to the Supreme Court, it could be seen as a justifiable action because some people would probably say, well, hey, what if I can't get out to a donor meeting and I want to have photos of Trump being out there, which is, you know, disingenuous, but maybe you want to create just blanket, uh, instead of using getting images or stock photos or something like that, you want to create uh, blanket images that you could use or stock images that you could just use at different events and different advertising promotions. And I would say, uh, maybe we should consider restricting that. I understand that it's going to cut down on certain costs. It's going to make elections a little bit cheaper, maybe, because they don't have to pay a photographer and all these different web designers and graphic designers to go out and actually uh, do all this hard work to make all the stock photos perfect and so on and so forth when you can have an AI generated a lot very, very quickly. Uh, I, I do understand all of those arguments. I understand the arguments for innovation as well. It's kind of putting your thumb on the scale saying, no, we can't take advantage of these and cut costs in certain campaigns. But maybe you're still allowed to do that in certain cases, just not for anything that is allowing you to make a claim that you visited a particular location, that you visited a certain community, that you spoke about a certain issue. Anything that's more specific than just, hey, Donald Trump uh, image in front of a flag or Donald Trump with flags flying behind him or military jets, like more promotional stuff that can be very general. But anything else that entails being around other people and representing them as being with a certain population, a certain demographic, because even though I said that not everybody is going to look at that and they're going to care because not everybody just looks and says, oh, that's my community. I'm going to vote with them. But it can have some effect on some people. If I see Donald Trump out there with a whole bunch of skiers and snowboarders and his little snow gear, and you know he's a little old snow Trump, then maybe that would be like, oh, he skis. If I saw Biden in ski gear, I'd be like, oh, well, he's healthy enough to go out and ski. I love that, and he's you know skiing with my with my community, man. Hmm, maybe I should uh, listen up here. And let's be clear, uh, I don't think that actually seeing them with any AI generated 
skiing or snowboarding clips would actually change my mind. But my point standing, it could change somebody's mind. It could make them rethink a certain thing. And maybe the rethinking is not a bad thing, but maybe if it causes doubt in their mind, it wouldn't be a good thing. But hey, maybe we all just need to be super skeptical. Maybe the government does need to actually stay out of it. And we just need to be vigilant individuals. And I think that is also a solution if we can't find a reasonable way to do it in government without curtailing everybody's rights and stifling the innovations that could be brought on to campaigns through use of different AI technologies and things like that. So let's jump to our final article that comes from the National Review. And the headline reads, NYC homeowner arrested after heated disagreement with squatters claiming tenant right tenants rights in a one million dollar home. And when I first read that, I was like, wait, whoa, 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 calm down here. What do you mean somebody is a squatter and claiming that they have a right to this property? Well, um, maybe we should go to the one, two, three, fourth paradigm. Let's go down a little bit further because it actually highlights what the law is when we get down here. Uh, quote, to evict a squatter, a property owner must send a 10-day eviction notice and then file a court complaint if the order is disregarded. And here's the other part that actually highlights what the problem is or how they're able to actually claim that they had uh, tenants' rights in New York City. Quote, in New York City, squatters can claim tenant rights after living on a property for 30 days. This tenant protection law is much more generous than the one in New York's statewide law, which requires a squatter to remain on a property for 10 years before gaining such rights. A squatter refers to any person who is unlawfully occupies an uninhabited building without the landlord's permission. So you're telling me, and hey, I'm not going to do this. I don't want anybody to go do this. But you're telling me that I could go to a really expensive apartment that if nobody's there half the time, uh, I just live on that property for uh, 30 days. And then, hey, I at least I have a legal claim to being a tenant. And at least I could battle this out in court. Um, I think this will not end up going the way of the squatter. Uh, the kind woman who got the house is Adra Lar- Adra Andaloro. I'm sorry if I mispronounced her name, ma'am. And she was just trying to resolve this very quickly. Hey, bring in the police. We'll get it all solved. I can't do this weird eviction notice and then take it through the courts because it will take like a month or two months. And now, because she had called the police twice within basically one day, and there were two series of squatters, they removed the first one, the second one came back and said that they have the rights, and then they arrested the woman who actually got this as a hand-me-down from her mother and father after they passed. Now she's going to have to deal with this. And when I say she was arrested, she was detained and taken into uh, the police precinct. And you know, not, it's not the end of the world. She's probably going to fight it on court. But now it's going to take 20 months instead of the possible one, two, three, four months that it probably would have taken. So this process has just been elongated. She's not going to be able to sell her house. It's worth a million dollars now. What if the market absolutely crashes? She comes out of this whole situation 20 months later. She's only able to get, I mean, it's New York. So she'll probably still be able to get like 800000 700000 for the house. But at the end of the day, that's not fair to her whatsoever that she has to put up with this baloney that after 30 days, 30 days, she can't even change the locks because the tenants are saying, or the quote unquote tenants are saying, hey, no, uh, actually that interferes with my ability to come in and out of this place that I don't even own, that I don't even pay for, that I don't rent, that I don't have a contract for. It's freaking idiotic. But hey, you know what? As we highlighted with our first article, uh, New York is a special case in a whole bunch of different areas. So the fact that something like this is happening in NYC uh, does not surprise me. So let's get out of the way from all that negative stuff. Let's jump into our daily delight. This one comes from Adventure, and the headline reads, Hiker discovers adorable abandoned bear cub in Vermont woods. And when I first read this, I thought it was satire. I was like, whoa, hold on. 
don't touch the bear. Don't ever touch a bear, baby. That is that is crazy. But it turns out eventually they actually called in the forces here in Vermont, the wildlife services. Uh, they followed it for a while. It ended up in an abandoned cave. The mother was not present. So they actually uh, rescued the bear, and they're taking it to a habitat where it can live until it's old enough to go out in the wild. Uh, don't pick up. Don't just assume in the future. I mean, anybody who knows anything about uh, being out there in the wilderness about bears, don't just assume that it is a lost bear. Don't just assume that mom is not around if you hear one crying. Uh, and don't just pick it up and go because you may be attacked. But in this case, it was the handiwork of two uh, forester individuals and a woman who was hiking. So if you wanted to check out any of the cute photos from this article or you want to read any of today's articles, there'll be a link in the description below the like and subscribe button. Also down there, you can find the link to the podcast on Spotify, Pocket Cast, Google Podcast, as well as Podvine and the Twitter handle at Your Daily Flip, where I post a Twitter tirade every Tuesday and Thursday. So with all that said, there's only one more thing to say. Stay safe. Don't die.